smile as you walk down the aisle as I hold you in my arms I feel safe and warm I'm not on my own I'm not even left alone cause you are here with me I love to see you smile as you walk down the aisle as I hold you and warm I'm not on my own I'm not even left alone cause you are here with me yeah. follow God's command by joining in this holy bond and oh it makes me happy we're walking hand in hand and so we'll walk in pride cause we're walking Side by side we'll be a family oh, 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 I love to see you smile As you walk down the aisle As I hold you in my arms I feel safe and warm I'm not on my own I'm not even left alone Cause you are here with me Ask God's blessings over both of us. I pray God will bless in our hearts, long and lasting trust. So that if we're far apart, still we'll be in each other's hearts, no matter what the test. Baby, you're the best. Oh, I love to see you smile as you walk down the aisle, as I hold. Thank you so very much, uh, George and Kendria. Beautiful song. I love to see you smile. Absolutely a lovely song. Healing words. Wise words are like deep waters. Wisdom flows from the wise like a bubbling brook. Proverbs 18 and verse 4. People are thirsty. People have gone through heartache. They've been pushed down by life. And when we think of healing for them, a lot of times we tend to think, you know, let me pray for them. But we also need to recognize that our words have healing power, like life-giving water. When you're kind, when you're encouraging, when you don't just think something good, but you take the time to verbalize it, you're being a healer. It is important that we recognize the power of kind words, simple compliments, the power of an I believe in you. You're going to make it. Great things are in store for us. I love you so much. I'm so happy that you're my husband or you're, that you're my wife. You are my favorite person. 
Your words may seem ordinary to you, but when God breathes life into them, they become extraordinary to your partner. So at this time, I'm going to pause a little and give you the opportunity to say some healing words to your spouse or a word of affirmation, encouragement, and love. I don't need you to open up your camera or your mic. I don't want to hear. I'm just giving you a little time to say what you need to say to your loved one. Lots of excitement. Oh, you don't see pastor beside me today and not hearing me saying anything to you because we are in two different spaces today. So heart to heart connection family, welcome to this, the second week of our seminar series. So happy to have you back with us this week. Heart to heart connection, is a family ministries department of the Jamaica, is an initiative of the family ministries department of Jamaica Union of Seventh-day Adventists. It is a seminar uh, designed for family life leaders, couples, pastors, and just everyone and anyone who is interested in enriching their relationships and that of the members of our churches and even communities. And so I know last week we started off with a bang and we had uh, an amazing, two amazing presentations, one from, from Pastor, one from Pastor Lloyd Allen. And he spoke about, you know, getting into a competition of love. He said it's the only competition that we should be we should be in um, with each other where we are trying to see who can out love the other. And then we also had a presentation entitled Rekindling the Flame. <coughs> Sorry, Rekindling the Fire by Pastor Dennis. And Dr. Dennis shared some valuable tips about how we can keep the fire burning in our relationship. And today we have so much more in store for you all. I want to extend a special welcome to our administrators at the Jamaica Union, Pastor Everett Brown, our president, Pastor Levi Johnson, executive secretary, and Pastor Adelaide Blythe, the treasurer. We also want to extend welcome to the vice president, Dr. Joseph Smith, and all the directors and staff right there at Jamaica Union. Special welcome also to the administrators, directors, pastors of the different fields. And a special welcome to our family ministries directors here in the Jamaica Union, Pastor Parkinson, Pastor Wilson, Pastor Johnson, Dr. Norman Thompson, and Pastor Garfield Manderson. Welcome also to our friends from the Belize Union, with our director, Pat Nemhart, who's so very supportive. Welcome. Welcome to all the couples here in the here in Jamaica Union, all the couples in the Belize Union, and other couples who may be joining from other places. Last week, we saw Cayman and Turks and Caicos um, logging in. We saw persons from the United States of America and Canada, and possibly even England. Welcome. Welcome to those who may not be Seventh-day Adventists, but maybe your neighbor shared this, this flyer with you or invited you. Uh, welcome, welcome, welcome. This evening, our devotional speaker is one who is passionate about families. He served at the Jamaica Union as family life director. And during his tenure, I, one of the things that really stood out with me, one of the programs that he would have organized was when he invited Dr. Willie Oliver and his wife, Elaine Oliver, to the, who are the General Conference Family Life Directors, and he invited them for a couples enrichment program at Northern Caribbean University. And I remember that Sabbath morning, thousands of couples from around Jamaica traveled to the gymnatorium at NCU. It was jam-packed, and it was just a beautiful, beautiful program 
of couples coming together to be enriched and educated and for a and for recommitment. It was such a beautiful program. Dr. Nathan, past president of East Jamaica Conference, is our devotional speaker for this evening. Dr. Nathan and his dear wife, Carol, work together in team ministry, and they are the parents to an adult daughter, Karine. And overall, they are just a happy family. What you see is what you get. And so we welcome at this time, Dr. Nathan, who will share the devotional thoughts. Thank you, Sister Dennis. I want to recognize the presence of our leaders at headquarters at the Jamaica Union, Pastor Brown and his team of officers and workers. I want to say thanks to Pastor Roy for inviting me to share in this special presentation that we will be having here this afternoon. I was blessed last week as we listened to the different presentations. And I want to commend the Family Life Department of Jamaica Union for making an effort to enrich the lives of our members and our neighbors. And so this afternoon, I just want to thank God for the opportunity that I have to, to share with you the devotional this afternoon. As we begin, let us pray. Loving Lord, we thank you for being such a good God to us. And we thank you for the way you have guided us over the years. And we thank you for your church, which makes provision to minister to the needs of our members and to the needs of our families. And this afternoon, as we come together, we pray that your divine presence will rest Remain and abide with us. I pray that the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart will be acceptable in your sight. For Lord, you are my strength and our redeemer. Amen. The, the topic, heart-to-heart -heart connection. And, and while we commend the, the department for trying to keep the ideal before our couples, we must be sensitive to the reality that for heart-to-heart -heart connection to be realized, we must understand that this is not normal. For heart-to-heart -heart connection to happen, we must know that it will not be by coincidence. It has to be by a determined effort. It has to be intentional as we seek to struggle against the odds. And so many times couples panic and give up on their marriages because they experience conflicts. But I want to say to us that as we present the devotion this evening in the context, welcome El Lord, as we, as we present our devotion in the context of the great controversy, we need to begin at the beginning at the creation story. Remember after creation that the Bible says, God saw that all things that he has made, they were very good. And he, he, he made the man and his wife to be a perfect couple. And for a period of time, the couple, their hearts were in unison, in perfect harmony. And we must understand that as they, as they shared intimate relationship, the Bible says in Genesis chapter 2 and verse 24, therefore shall a man leave his mother, his father and his mother, and shall cleave unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. And they were both naked, the man and his wife, and were not ashamed. The heart of Adam and his wife were in perfect harmony. Everything was going well. It was only after the disease of sin had contaminated this couple that they began to experience conflict. 
It is from this experience that all of us, all couples that we come across will experience conflict. And it is from this experience every couple become prone, prone to distress, discord, and divorce. Since the entrance of sin, we are caught in the crossfire of what we call the great controversy. What is the great controversy? The great controversy is a struggle, struggle between good and evil, between truth and hero, struggle between justice and injustice. It's a struggle between the great contenders, Christ and Satan. And we are caught in the middle of this crossfire. And there is, there is a war on. And there's a battle that is posed for our minds, a battle against the mind. According to what, what Revelation 12, verse 7 said, and there was war in heaven, and Michael and his angels fought against the dragon. And the dragon fought on his angels. And the great dragon was caught out, is cast out of heaven, that old serpent, Satan, the devil. And verse 10 says, And I heard a voice out of him saying, The accuser of the brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. Yes, we are in a, a war, a struggle, the great controversy. And every day, it is the choices that we make will determine our success or failure. Verse 12 of Revelation 7, we are, we are looking at heart to heart, but we are putting that against the battle of the great controversy. Therefore rejoice ye heaven, and he that dwell in them. And woe to the inhabitants of the earth and the sea, for the devil is come down unto you, having great wrath, because he knows that is time is short. You know, as we strive for this connection, the heart to heart connection, we must be sensitive to the struggle. And there are some individuals who believe that after you get married, you're going to live happily ever after. But no, that is not so. It is going to be a constant struggle. Peter in chapter 5, 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8 says, as, as we seek to work together, we must be sensitive to the fact that the adversary, we have an adversary, like a roaring lion, he walks about seeking to devour. What the devil, the devil wants to devour? The devil wants to devour, to devour our homes. He wants to devour our families. He wants to develop, devour the couples of our church. And so, Every couple must be sensitive to this reality, the reality of the spiritual warfare that we are caught up in. And we should not panic when there are conflicts because this is the reality. It is a struggle and the struggle will continue until Jesus Christ puts an end to the great controversy. So what the devil wants to see is conflicts between husband and wife, conflict between parents and children, conflicts between siblings. You know, it is true that after the, the, the wedding day that the couple who leaves the altar hoping that it will be peace and joy forever will soon realize that the struggle is something that we must be sensitive to. After the honeymoon period, what usually happens is that more conflicts are, are, are experienced. Conflicts will increase. What I'm trying to do this evening is to say we shouldn't panic when we, when we realize that we are faced with conflict. It is very important that our couples, couples should understand that because couples are good, because couples will experience conflict, we must anticipate conflict. Yes, anticipate conflict. We must understand that because it is, it is something that is normal, that conflict, it is inevitable. And so we must be prepared to deal with it. You know, 
Nancy Van Pelt in her book to have on the whole on to hold says that we must we must look to some realities, and that is that conflicts will happen in, in families. And she, she pointed out that five days before the, the, the monthly cycle begins, that the, the wives will be more sensitive and less tolerant. But the Frankfurt explains that it is at this time that before the, 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 the period begins and during the period that a lot of conflicts take place in the homes. Well, if this is so, then, then what should a good husband do? A good husband should realize that it is at this time when the wife is less, less, well, more sensitive, will need a husband who is more accommodative and patient and forgiving. And so I will propose before I go seven basic assumptions. One of them is that if we accept the argument that male and female are created equal but different. Two, if we accept the fact that male and female speak different languages. Three, if we affect the fact that we all have different love languages. Four, if we accept the fact that we do have different temperament types. Five, if we accept the fact that we have been cultured by different dynamics from within different family of origin. And six, if we, if we accept the fact that men and women do not necessarily function on the same side of the brain, while men are left brain dominant, wives are right brain dominant. And that's a whole presentation that talks about what we should expect. Number seven, if we accept the fact that women would speak more words than men in a given day, then it is not unusual that because we are so different that we will, we will have conflicts in our relationship. And it is also true that because of all these seven realities, that whether consciously or unconsciously, we will offend each other. It is also true that we will not have peace and unity and love until we accept the recommendation of Jesus in Matthew 6, that, that we are so different that we are going to offend each other, we are going to rub each other the wrong way, we are going to have conflicts. And so, and so Jesus says, in the light of all the above, it is important that we forgive each other because we are going to hurt each other. We are going to rub each other the wrong way. We, we should seek forgiveness and we should be prepared to give forgiveness without which there will be no peace. It is true, and this is something I want to leave with all of us, that, that we are all born with sinful natures, sinful tendencies. And, and what Jeremiah 17 verse 9 says, the, the, the natural human heart that we are born with is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who, who can understand the human heart? And so I'm saying this evening that, that, that arts that are not transformed will be spiteful, resentful, abusive, and wicked. So, so, so the challenge we're having is the, the, the natural heart as against the transformed heart. Because of the natural heart that is deceitful and desperately wicked, it is not unusual that in our best effort to do that which is right, that we will end up many times doing that which is against the, the, the principles of, of good communication and good behavior. And I want to say to us before we go, Romans chapter 7, verse 19 is something that was bear in mind. That husband and wife and children have the same challenge that the Apostle Paul did. He said in verse 19, for the good that I would, I do not. For the evil which I would not, that is what I do. And so he struggled to do well, to be somebody who will be less offensive. But there are times when, because of the sinful nature 
we offend each other. One of the challenges that we will face in life is not that we would offend and make mistakes and do things that we didn't want to do. But, but when we would have erred, it is so important that we, we do not allow pride to get between the, the, the husband and the wife and the family. One of our great challenges to deal with is the challenge of pride. Someone rightly said that it is better to lose your pride to the one you love than to lose the one you love because of your pride. The truth is that many divorces that, that, that happens, it is not necessarily that everybody wants to, to, to go as far as divorce, but sometimes it is, it is pride that gets in the way. I don't want to apologize. I don't want to say I'm sorry. I do, and, and pride can get in the way and cause us to lose the one we love. We want to, to explain that the fact that we were born with sinful natures, and because when we want to do good, evil presents itself, we offend our spouses, we offend our children, we offend our neighbors, we offend our church members. And, and that is not something we plan to do. It just happens sometimes that the devil, the devil gets the better of us. And, and so I would want us this afternoon as we get involved in our presentation that we, we pray the prayer of David in Psalm 51 that the Lord would give us a new heart, a transformed heart, a heart that will be like Jesus Christ, one that will seek to be unselfish. We should pray the prayer of the psalmist in Psalm 139 that says, search me, O God, and know my heart, and try me, and know my thought, and see if there's any wicked ways in me and lead me in the way of everlasting. The good thing is that in Ezekiel 36, 26, the answer is given to us. A new art also will I give you, and a new spirit will I put within you. I will take away the natural heart, the stony heart out of your flesh, and I will give you a heart of flesh. Husbands and wives, will not be able to, to see the, that kind of connection until we experience that heart transplant. And so I hope that in our presentation and whatever we'll do, we will pray for the heart transplant because natural heart we are born with. If you have a husband that is wicked and spiteful and resentful, you know that he still has the natural heart. If you know a wife that is wicked, and spiteful and, and, and will say things that cut to the bone. You know that this wife still has the, the natural heart. But I pray this evening that all of us will strive for the new heart, the heart of flesh, the heart that will help us to, to, to see Jesus as our example, we want to be more like Jesus. Then we will experience what is called a love triangle. And the love triangle says, it's not about the wife or the husband. It is that we seek to get close to Christ. And as we go up on the sides of the triangle, the closer we get to Christ, it is natural that we get close to each other. And so I say, it is only against the background of the heart transplant that we will experience that heart to heart connection. When this experience takes over our lives, then we will have greater heart to heart connection and greater family enrichment. May, may God help us that we will continue to struggle that the Apostle Paul not to do the evil we don't want to do. But then at the end, he says, thanks be to God, through the power of Jesus Christ, we can have victory and we can overcome that old stony heart and experience the heart of flesh. If your husband is hurting you or your wife is hurting you, don't give up on them. You must join together as husband and wife and realize that what is happening is not just your husband is bad, but the devil is wicked and he uses your husband 
He uses our weak spot. If your wife is doing things that offend you, don't, don't give up. And so we should not seek to fight each other. At the family altar, we should come together and put our petitions to God. Resist the devil, the Bible says, and he will flee from us. And when we resist the devil and put our hands in the hand of God, then we will truly experience that heart-to-heart -heart connection. May God bless you. Shall we pray? Loving Lord, we recognize that we are in a battle, and there's a battle that is being fought for our minds. And it is the choices that we make that determines our successes or failures. And so we seek to encourage and empower our families. And we thank you for your church that has a department that seeks to minister to the needs of families. We thank you for Pastor and Sister Dennis. We pray that you'll bless them as they seek to use their skills and talents to bless the churches in East Jamaica, in West Jamaica, in Central Jamaica, North and Northeast Jamaica. May we in Jamaica, because of the family life emphasis that we are experiencing now, see to it that the heart to heart connection is what we continue to strive for. And even though it will not be perfect here on earth, when Jesus comes, let us strive to be together in the earth made new. Thank you, and may God bless you. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you, Sister Dennis. Amen. 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 And we will continue in prayer as we invite at this time Sister Archer. Um, wife of the president for North Jamaica Conference, uh, Sister Alicia, to go ahead and pray for us. Good evening, let us pray. Father in heaven, we are grateful for the power of prayer and for this privilege to approach you through one more time. We come seeking your forgiveness, seeking your cleansing. We recognize, Lord, that we want to have that heart-to-heart -heart connection with our spouses, with our children, our family members. But this can only be possible when our, heart, when our hearts are right with you. So this evening, we ask God that you give us a spirit of forgiveness. We have become hard and cold, and we are selfish in our ways. But this evening we pray, God, that you will break down the barriers, break down selfishness and the evil practices that are among us so that your spirit can take root in our hearts and give us that heart of love and forgiveness. We recognize that there are many forces that are coming against our marriages, our families. The spirit of adultery, fornication, selfishness some lord because they have they have increased in goods they believe they are not compatible again with their spouse and so they want to get a divorce they want separation but we pray this evening that we will seek to humble ourselves before you so that you can fix our marriages you can fix our homes you can fix our lives god our church is hurting at this time when we see the increase in divorce rates when we see the separations from leadership to the people but this evening we pray that as we gather here that we will lead by example and that we will allow your spirit to take full control in our hearts god we know that you are able but we have to be willing so this evening make us willing participants help us to give up self and selfishness so that you can have your way in our hearts and that you can mend us and mold us and put us in that position that you want us to be so that our hearts will be right with you and our marriages and our families will be right with you. We know you are able. So help us, Lord, know that we will let go and allow you to do your work in us and through us. For I ask these mercies in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Amen.
Amen. Thank you so very much, Sister Archer, for that, that, that sobering and beautiful uh, her. Thank you, Dr. Nathan, for those salient points this evening in your devotional uh, presentation. We need to be intentional in order for us to have that heart-to-heart -heart connection, because as you rightly say, the truth of it is the human part of us, um, that human heart, um, you know, wants to do wants to do good and it even presents itself. Uh, but if we are, we, we need to, in order for us to be on the same page, then we need to ensure that we are intentional and that we are connected with God. Um, you know, you said that fundamentally males and females are different and you gave us about seven differences. And so as a result of our differences, we are bound to come into conflict with each other. And, 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 and there would say, you know, teeth and tongue must meet, but the teeth must not bite off the tongue. And as such, it is important that we, um, we, we have a forgiving spirit, that we have forgiving hearts so that uh, we can be together on one page. I pray that this evening, having heard these words, that each of us, our prayer will be, Lord, please work on my heart. If it is that we need that heart transplant so that uh, peace and love can reign within our homes, within our families, within our relationships, and within our churches. This evening, may we submit ourselves so that that heart transplant can take place and we can enjoy beautiful relationships. Thank you so very much, Dr. Nathan. We are going to, at this time, move to a video presentation. Thank you so very much, Sister Chantel uh, Guthrie for organizing this so that we could hear a little from some of our participants. And so we're gonna move at this time to that video presentation. Dear Claudette. And Aston Genius. One of our memorable moments was when we decided to spend some deeper, closer, longer emotional time together away from the children. So we packed our bags with Lasco, nuts, oats, sardines, and headed for Miami, not to spend time with our relatives, but at a hotel for a whole week where we could hold hands on the mall and just cuddle and be frozen together with each other in ecstasy. These memories have a lasting impression on our relationship and we often look with fond memories to these memorable moments. Hello everyone, we are Pastor and Sister Guthrie. <laughs> the countries! <laughs> Alright, so we are very new to the marriage life. We are sharing our favorite memory. So my favorite memory since we've been married and there was a particular evening when we came home and I was very tired and the pastor had meetings that day as well. I don't remember why he was not home, but we were both not home. And you know, usually I'm the one who goes in the kitchen and this particular evening, pastor came in the kitchen without me even calling for him and we cooked together. And you know, we had a very intimate moment in the kitchen. One of my love languages, help. <laughs> so, so that really stood out for me. We married her birthday and we spent we spent a, a good a good day out in out in nature, you know, seeing the animals. You know, she wasn't she wasn't very scared. She actually enjoyed 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 herself, and we got to got to see the creatures in their little different setting and how they interacted with each other. And and we also we also had a nice to stroll and a wonderful a wonderful meal meal afterwards. You know, so 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 many so many wonderful wonderful things came together on, on that day, and and that's very. So it's meaningful and lasting to me. Uh, nothing like good quality time together. And I look forward to making many more, many, many, many more memories. So let's see what the Lord has in store. But it has been good so far. Hello, everyone. My name is Nuvia Makalo. And I'm Ricardo Makalo. And we have been married for 15 years. And I want to share with you my favorite memory in our marriage was when we just got married, we were living in a one room space. And when I say one room, I mean like 
there was kitchen, living room, bedroom in one space. And this is my favorite memory because I remember a time when it was just the two of us against the world. We were just starting out and we had each other's backs and we were really getting to start a new life, a new page together. So that's my favorite memory. Beautiful. My favorite memory. Um, there are many memories, but in context of today, I just want to share how happy and excited I was at the time when both of us was graduating from Northern Caribbean University. It's a, it was an eye point in our life. Uh, we started out with that journey as a stepping stone and we reached our milestone and it was excited. I mean, that was stream across the world and the entire universe were able to watch. My beloved, we graduated together. together. We liked um, how we share our memories because it shows where we're coming from and where we are today. And we hope that this memory have impacted you as well. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I'm getting all teary eyed. I'm very mushy um, listening to the memories. That was absolutely beautiful. And it was a, it was a nice combination of, of those who have been married for quite some time and those who have just gotten married and, you know, some persons who have been on the journey for some time. And so thank you all so very much for those memories. I know that now within our homes, there everyone who is online now is now looking to the other and saying, you know, what would be our favorite memory? What is your favorite memory? And so I, I use this time to, 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 to spend a little time to find out from your spouse, what was your favorite memory and share what was, what, what, what was my favorite memory so that uh, we can have that reconnection. And it's always good to, go, to take a walk down memory lane, to roll back the curtains of memories and you know just remember where it is that we are coming from and what are things we've been through and how it is that we are at this point. And then look forward to whatever it is that God has in store for us. Thank you so very much, couples, for those beautiful memories. We're going to move at this time right into our first presentation with Pastor Lloyd Allen. Uh, last week, we would have met uh, Pastor Allen and his beautiful wife, Ray, and he gave us a awe-inspiring presentation slash sermon um, uh, because he was so impassioned in his speaking, uh, moving from drama to love. Stop the acting and let us live out love in our daily lives. And so at this time, we're going to now be hearing building emotional connectivity. And without any further ado, we move right into that presentation. Welcome, Pastor Allen. Welcome, Sister Allen. Thank you, thank you so much, um, Dr. and Sister Dennis and all, and the entire host at the Jamaica Union and elsewhere. We are just so excited to share with you during these special moments. Last week, we had a good time. We enjoyed it, my wife and I. And this week, I tell you, will be no different. But um, we have a limited time, of course, right now. We have, we'll be going on to quarter to to seven your time, quarter to eight my time. It's now quarter to seven here. Um, so it's quarter to six there. So we have one hour. And so this is gonna be the structure of the program. My wife will be singing um, a, a starter song to get us to get us going, all right? And, and so that's five minutes, then I'll be speaking for 35 minutes. Then the other 20 minutes, we'll be having Q and A, your questions. So get ready, get your questions together and we hope to spend 20 minutes answering your questions tonight. And so welcome again, I'm so excited to have you. And right now my wife has something to say and then she will sing the clouds away. Good evening, everyone. It's really a pleasure to be here with you again tonight. Um, I'm really, really excited for what God has in store for each one of us. I have been blessed um, from last week and I'm looking forward to this session tonight. 
um, because I believe that unaided by divine power, our marriages are bound to fail. But by God's enabling strength, each marriage represented here tonight will emerge a success story. And so allow me very quickly, sweetheart, you didn't know this part, but I wanted just to um, share with you quickly, just this past week, you know, one of the days, I can't remember exactly, probably Wednesday, when I was coming coming home from work and I, re I had a really, really rough time at work. Um, I had to deal with some issues with the, you know, with, with, with the people that I manage. And so I prayed and I called my, my sweetheart and I said, you know, I talk it over to him. And I, when I came home, I was just, I'm, I told him, I'm just really, really blessed to have you in my life. And you're not only a friend, but a confidant. And I can always share my feelings and my emotions with you without, without being judged. You're always there to listen. And so I really treasure you. I really cherish you. Just <laughs> <laughs> I just want you to know that. And so I'm going to sing Cherish the Treasure, the Treasure of You. Um, I hope our hearts will be blessed. And this is also dedicated to you tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Cherish the treasure, the treasure of you. Lifelong companion, I give myself to you. God has enabled me to walk with you faithfully and cherish the treasure, the treasure of you. As I obey God's Spirit's voice and seek to do His will, I then can see the wisdom of His plan. For as he works, this way will be, I then can love you so complete, and by his grace, I pledge my love to you. I cherish the treasure, the treasure of you. Lifelong companion, I give myself to you. God has enabled me to walk with you faithfully and cherish the treasure, the treasure of you. This sacred vow I make to you does not contain an if. Though I'm aware that trials lie ahead, I will love you and pray with you. And through it all, I will stay with you. Our home will be a refuge of unconditional love. I cherish the treasure, the treasure of you. 
my long companion, I give myself to you. God has enabled me to walk with you faithfully and cherish the treasure, the treasure of you. And cherish the treasure, the treasure of you. All right, I just wanna say thanks to my sweetheart. That's what I call her, I call her my sweetheart for that beautiful song. And with this reminder, I'm inspired to move and to speak to God's people with the passion with which God blesses me. I treasure, I cherish the treasure of you. Thank you, and I hope um, by the end of this program, every couple represented here will be excited sharing those sentiments to each other as well. Let's move right into the program. As we know, uh, we don't have much time because I want to take your Q&A, your questions at the end. So let us go right in. And remember, our topic tonight is what? Building emotional connectivity. Amen. What is it? building emotional connectivity. Let us pray, loving Father, come by here tonight and speak through me to your people. We'll give you the honor, the glory, and the praise in Jesus' name, amen. Oh, building emotional connectivity. Now, what, you know, when God made marriage, and by the way, you may find God is the author of marriage. After God brought man and woman together and wed them in the only state of matrimony, God jubilantly declared, it is very good. What does that mean? Oh, friends, God made marriage to be very good. That's right. God made marriage to be very good. Everything about God is abundance and goodness and happiness and joy. Amen. Oh, after he made Adam and Eve, you know, uh, he said to Adam, of all the trees in the garden, you may freely, oh, that's abundance. You may freely eat. Is that right? Of all the trees, watch this. God believes in abundance. So in our marriage, he says, I come that you may have life and have it more abundantly. So even in our marriage, we should be experiencing exultant joy, ecstatic moments, so much so that we always desire to be with that special one. So God made marriage to be very good. So watch this now. If my marriage is not very good, I'm not to point a finger at God, but that's not God's fault, right? Oh, it's, 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 as a matter of fact, I share this with you. If I'm angry with my wife, if I'm impatient with my wife, it's not God's fault. No, I'm at fault. I'm to blame. So I need to, I need to learn something new. I need to turn over a new leaf and do something differently. And that's why we are here, so we can be renewed. We can be changed by the renewing of our mind. Amen. Oh, we can change our marriage by just changing our mindset. And so, friends, I'd like you to follow me very carefully tonight. Now, what's emotion? Emotional connectivity. You know, friends, when we study emotion, there are three fundamental aspects of emotion. But I want to share with you two basic ones. Number one, evaluation and response. Watch this now. When when, when something happened to a person, 
when something happens to us, you see, and we don't, first of all, we evaluate, evaluation. We evaluate, does this enhance my goal? And if it does not enhance my goal, I'm upset, I'm irritated. That's emotion. But if it enhances my goal, then I'm happy. That's emotion. And so that's evaluation. We evaluate immediately. Does it enhance my goal? And this is why different people respond differently to different scenarios. Because for some people, the same thing may, may fail to enhance one person's goal. And at the same time, it enhances another person's goal. And so they respond differently. So that's emotion. It's all about, does it, how does it feature in the context of my goals and my objectives in life? That's it. And so, friends, emotional connectivity. If you want your spouse to be connected with you, to respond well, Whatever you do, you must seek to meet their goals in life. That has to do with their values, their belief system. In, in other words, their needs. That's it. Does it meet my needs? And if they don't meet my needs, I'll be dissatisfied, I'll be miserable, I'll be distraught. But if it meets my needs, then I'll be happy. That's emotion. Watch this, friends. In our marriage, we should be aiming for one thing. Emotional connectivity. Oh, Dr. Nathan repeated that verse so beautifully earlier. And that's exactly what the Bible says. What, what does it say there? That in marriage, we should, we, we married to, when we came together, by the way, when we came together, he says, wherefore shall a man leave his father and mother and shall cleave to his wife and they shall be one flesh. Hello. That's the principal goal of marriage. Oneness. One flesh. Emotional connectivity. In other words, intimacy. In, in simple language, that's what it means. Intimacy. One flesh. Hello today. Cleave. We're not talking about cleaving like those paper glue, you know. We're talking about like those crazy glue. Clean, inseparable. That's the principal goal of marriage. Clean. Emotional connectivity. Intimacy. But friends, for that to happen, we must be meeting needs. Did you know, friends, everybody marries to have their needs met? Amen. We got married to have our needs met. And if our needs are not met, we are dissatisfied, uncomfortable, un and unhappy. Therefore, every person who is married has one, must have one purpose, one object in life. And that is, I need to know what your needs are so I can meet them. Did you know there's a lot of people who are trying to meet their partner's needs, but they don't know what those needs are? The husband said, but imagine, I bought you the car, I bought you this, I bought you that. But you're still not happy. Could it be you don't know what her needs are? The wife is saying, imagine, I'm so good to you. I prepare your meal, I wash your clothes, I give you a clean house, and you're still not happy. Could it be she does not know what his needs are? And there are many people who are trying to meet their partner's needs. But the home is still in fury. Why? You are meeting their needs, but you don't know what their needs are. Did you know, friends, you can't live happily with a person except you know them. You know their needs. Hello. Do you know the Bible talks about that? First Peter 3 and verse 7. Listen to me very carefully. The Bible says, husbands, dwell with them according to knowledge. Amen. In other words, you cannot live with a woman except you understand her. Amen. And, and you cannot live with a man except you master the art of manhood. Amen. And you know why it's important? Listen to the rest of the text. 
We have to, uh, he says, dwell with them according to knowledge. Another version says, dwell with them in an understanding way. Why? Giving honor unto her as unto the weaker vessel and as being heirs together of the grace of life. Why? That your prayers be not hindered. Oh, did you know, friends, that the wrong treatment of your spouse can cause God to stop his ears when you pray? Mm -mm -mm -mm. That your prayers be not hindered. And did you know, friends, failure to meet their needs can put the marriage in disarray, chaos, toxicity, and failure. Dwell with them according to knowledge. Know their needs and meet those needs. Amen. Oh, this brings me to another thing. Another point I want to make. Did you know, friends? Pastor, why should I meet their needs? Da, da, da. What, what happened? Friend, did you know that you'll get married to serve? Ooh, really? Yes. The foundation of marriage is service. That's right. Service. Amen. Sometimes I like to say to people, you know, be like your master. Mark chapter 10, Mark 10, verse 45. You know, the Bible says, oh, Jesus came. Mm -mm -mm. Not to be served. Oh, not to be served. Some people enter marriage, you know. <laughs> Just to be served. Oh, I want a man to take care of me, to show him with all the good things. That's good. But friends, our mentality, when we get married, must be to serve. So Jesus, it is said of Jesus, he came not to be served, not to be ministered unto, but to minister, but to serve. You marry to serve. Amen. I love that. You marry to serve. There are some words the Bible uses as relates to service. He says in Deuteronomy, cheer up your wife. Deuteronomy 24, verse 5. First Peter 3, verse 7. He says, honor her. Honor him. That's service. Ephesians 5, 33. He says, husband, love her. That's service. Then he says, wife, respect him. That's service. Oh, yes. Then Rome, he says, Ephesians 5, 25. He says, Sacrifice for your spouse. Jesus says, do marriage the way I treat my bride. Treat your bride as I treat my bride. And Jesus loves his bride so much that it took him to his grave. That's sacrifice. I talked about that this, yesterday. So friend, watch this now. Serving your spouse. Quickly, let me highlight to you the needs of men and women I have. 20 minutes in which to do so. So very quickly, I want to share two, spend two minutes on each need. Five needs of the man and five needs of the woman. Are you ready for the journey? Oh, fasten your seat belt, friend. We are ready to go. Sometimes I say, get a piece of paper and a pen. So, but since you have the tape, that's okay. But listen very carefully, friends. Meeting needs. Let's, who should we start with now? You know, I like to start with the wife's needs. Amen. You know, God himself always begins with the man. Amen. God always begins with the man. Psalm 128 and verse 3, he says, Your wife shall be as a fruitful vine, not a withered vine. Always beginning with the man. Walked in the garden in the cool of the day. He says, Adam, we were... Always beginning with the man. Let's begin with the man. What are her needs? The needs that the man should know so he can meet her needs. Serve her. Amen. Number one, a woman has a need to talk. Amen. What about that? She wants conversation. So if you are too busy, Traveling all over the world, call her and talk to her as often as you can. And if you are a workaholic, make sure you carve out a portion of time so she can be engaged with you. A lot of men sometimes make a mistake here. Working so hard, making a living that he's not living. <laughs> Watch it, friend. That's serious. 
You said, but I bring you money. I bring you this. Watch this. She did not marry your money. She married you. Amen. She did not marry the car. She married you. She did not marry the house. She married you. She wants you personally to have conversation with. Do you know what the number one cause of divorce in, 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 the, in, in the elite? Yes. Those superstars. You know what the number one cause of divorce is? Lack of time with each other. Lack of quality time. That's it. We must spend time talking. Why does she talk? She talks for, for three reasons by space. Number one, she talks to connect with you. Number two, she talks to sort, S-O-R-T, to sort her thoughts. She comes home from work in the evening. The first question you better ask her, how was your day? Hell, <laughs> but she had a hard day, she wanted to talk to you. It's not that she wants advice, no. It's not that she wants somebody to fix her and to fix her issues, no. She wants a sounding board. Hello to the amen. <laughs> so when she's ready to talk, your job is to listen. Friends, let me tell you this. And the next thing, the next reason why a woman talk is to unburden her heart. It's not all the time she's in need of advice. No, as a matter of fact, if you listen long enough, many times she solves her own problems just by talking. When you listen to her, you're giving her therapy. Listening is, a, is therapeutic for her. For she gets an opportunity to unburden her heart and she feels relieved at the end. If you want to be a great husband, be a great listener. Amen. Oh, you know, one man, he was married for about 70 years. He, he was asked, what, what's the secret of the longevity of your marriage? He says, whenever my wife is ready to talk, I just turn off my hearing aid. Amen. Oh, you didn't get that. In other words, no interruption. Amen. Especially when she's upset. Mm -mm -mm. If she's upset and ready to talk, you listen, hello, and if you should interrupt her, it must be with the words. Tell me more, amen, tell me more. Oh yes, so if you wanna be a great husband, you gotta learn to be a great listener. Number two, a woman needs honesty. Mm -mm. Honesty, I call it H-O-T, she's hot. Don't forget that, hello, she's hot. What does the acronym H-O-T mean? Watch this now. She wants honesty, she wants openness, and she wants transparency. Transparency. So if you start to hide your phone and your text and your email password, oh friends, and you start to sleep with your phone in your pocket, then you know something is wrong and you are going to have a hard road to hold with that woman. Oh, she wants transparency. Another thing, she wants a commitment to marriage, to the relationship. She wants a commitment to family. She wants to feel secure that when, 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 when she's driving on the road, she's with her friends, wherever she is, she must have a calm assurance that she has a husband who will be with her for the long haul. Amen. She wants commitment to the relationship. Watch this, friends. It's either all or nothing at all for her. Amen. So when you are single, well, you may say, well, I can be my own man. But when you get married, you are accountable to somebody. So if she calls you on the phone and says, honey, where are you? What are you going to say? I'm my own. Why should I tell you where I am? Hey, you're so inquisitive. Really? No, you're not your own man anymore. Hello today. When you get married, you're accountable to somebody. You know what the word is? The word is called join. Amen. You're joined. Joined together. So whatever one does, it affects the other. Joined. So she wants a commitment to family. She wants honesty. She wants openness. Talk with her freely. 
Number three, she wants leadership. She wants what? Leadership. She wants leadership. She wants you to lead. Oh, friends, what kind of leadership does she want? Listen to me, I talk about the four, the three P's. <laughs> oh, the three P's, the three P, P as in Pauline. She wants a protector. She wants a, she wants a protector and she wants a provider and she wants a priest. Amen, the three P's. She wants you to lead be a spiritual leader in the home. You got to be the priest in the home. She expects it of you. She wants spiritual leadership. Number four, she needs affection. Amen. She what? She needs affection. She needs affection. But Pastor, you see, I'm sorry, I'm not the affectionate type. <laughs> you see, Pastor, you don't understand, man. I was I was raised a Tarzan, you know. I mean, I'm rough. I was grown up on the, I mean, I was grown up in the jungle. I'm rough. But guess what? When you get married, you've got to change that. Oh, a woman wants tender, loving care, tenderness. You must know what it means to whisper in her ears, I love you. Mm -mm -mm. And if I were to do it again, it would still be you. Amen. Oh, man. One man, you know, one man, he go, when the wife goes to work, she would call, he would call her on the phone, you know, and says, honey, mm -mm -mm. today I was writing my mother a letter. Amen. <laughs> But every word I put on the paper was your name. Amen. Oh, she wants to hear those words. Amen. Even if it's sweet nonsense. She wants affection. Love her with your words. The proverbial virtuous woman of Proverbs 31. Right? She emerged into virtue. Why? She had a husband that praised her. Yes. She wants affection, gentle, tender, loving care. Somebody who remembers her, remembers her birthday. Oh, I know for men, it may not be a big thing. But for ladies, remember those special days, the anniversary. Remember them, friends. And acknowledge her on those special days. Also, finally, she needs affirmation. Yes. Essentially, more or less similar. She needs affirmation and validation. When she's working so hard, she needs to know that somebody understands what she's going through. That's it. What do you think is the number one cause of, low, uh, 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 of depression in women? What do you think it is? You know what it is? Low self-esteem. Because many times nobody validates her for her work. Nobody remembers. Nobody acknowledge her hard work. Hello, friend, watch this now. You've got to start to tell your, tell her that you love her. Tell love to her. Tell respect. Don't just think it. But I think you're so wonderful already. Why do I always have to say, yes, she needs to hear it. Amen. It makes it. It's called affirmation. Love her with your words. Amen. Let me go to the man now very quickly. Five needs of the man. <laughs> you know, I've condensed these. You know, um, if you follow me carefully, as, as time progresses, you may hear um, the expanded version. But watch this now. Five needs of the man. And fasten your seatbelt. Amen. Because I have some things I want to share with you tonight about that man. And I hope you don't have any kids here because I want to talk to you candidly. All right? All right. So let's get ready. Number one, his first need. What is his first need? His first need is for respect. Really? How can I respect him? He's not respected. Look what he does. What's wrong with him? 
Watch this, friends. If you're a godly woman and you're a respectful woman, you'll respect him. It's not about what he does, but it is because of who you are. You are respectful, so you respect him. Amen. In other words, it was Martin Luther King who said it, don't never let a man drag you so low as to make you hate him. Oh, yes, friends. Oh, I like to draw on the mother's people. You know, Michel Obama once said it as well. He says, when they go low, you go high. Amen. Why? Because you are respectful. That's who you are. You're a woman of dignity. You're a woman of class. So certain words don't proceed from your mouth. Why? Because you must demonstrate to the waiting universe that you're a woman of high standing, a woman of honor. So whatever it is, you respect his position and you respect him. Amen. God has endowed him with the position as a leader in the home. You may not like everything he does, amen, but you respect him. Did you know, friends, that a man has a fragile ego? It is said that the most fragile, he says a man's ego is the most fragile thing in the universe. Do you know one of the most effective ways that a woman disrespects her man is by her words, her tongue. She fights with her tongue. She fights with her tongue. Sometimes I feel the pain of that man's heart. Ellen White says sometimes the words that are uttered to some spouses cause the angels to blush. I can imagine God, he turns his head away, for he cannot bear the sight. Oh, you took an oath, a vow on the wedding day to love and to cherish. And every day you belittle and disparage and, dis and discredit and, de and demean him and dehumanize him. Every time you do that, you are dealing a deathly blow to that marriage. Honor him with your words. Amen. And also you honor him with the way you relate to the children in his presence. Don't talk to the children a bad commentary about their dad, even if he's not at home, even if you have been divorced. Amen. You don't, you don't, you don't destroy the psyche of the children. You find the good in him and you celebrate him for it. Amen. Let's move on. Oh, you respect him. You know what a man desires most in his woman, in his wife? He wants her to treat him as her hero. In other words, she must be his most ardent fan. Oh, always cheering him on. He may fail sometimes, as all of us do. Nobody is perfect, but look beyond his faults and see his need, his need for encouragement, his need for mending. So as a wife, your job is to mend his brokenness. So remember, speak to the king in your mind. Amen. Next thing. A man needs, a man needs affirmation. He needs what? Affirmation. If you think he's doing good, don't be quiet. <laughs> Praise is not something you do. Praise is not reserved for some special occasion. Praise must be a lifestyle in your home. You affirm him, you praise him. Don't wait until he dies. Then you gather. You gather at the funeral. He was such a great man. How can I live without him? Did he know that? As a matter of fact, if some men knew it, maybe they would still be alive today. Amen. Friends, praise him. Find it in your heart to praise him. I know it's not going to come easy. 
because we are trained. Our mentality is such, we, you know, psychologically, we connect readily. We gravitate to the negative. But we have to retrain our brain, retrain our tongue to celebrate each other. Amen. <laughs> oh, be like Sarah. First Peter 3 and verse 6, uh, the Bible says, and Sarah called him Lord. Hello, when was the last time you looked on your husband and said, my Lord? Amen. What about that? Praise him. Praise him with your words. Number three, his need for domestic support. I'll be finishing in three minutes. Watch this, friends. His need for domestic support. He needs a support at home. He needs tranquility. Create a home that offers peace and quiet. He needs a refuge. Did you know a marriage was made? Not to be a storm in the harbor of life. No. A marriage was designed to be instead a harbor in the storm of life. Amen. Make that kind of home for him, a peaceful home. Number four, a man needs intimacy. Ooh, sexual fulfillment, intimacy. Did you hear that? I wanna talk to you ladies, I wanna talk to your heart just now. I know sometimes it may be a secondary issue for you. And it may not appear to be so important, but you must understand a man. A man has a strong attraction to the opposite sex. And here I'm talking about heterosexual relationship. Hello, amen. You know what I'm talking about? That's it. Listen now. In God's economy, it's monogamous, monogamous, right? No polygamous. One man, one woman. Amen. And relationship by one man to one woman. Amen. So listen now. A man has a strong attraction to a woman. If that need is not met, you know what you're doing? You are really setting the stage for infidelity. You are driving him in the arms of another woman, and God is not pleased. Hello, no wonder God says, "Defraud ye not one another." But Pastor, I don't feel like it. You know, you know how it is. I agree. A man is to be understanding. I wish I had time to talk more about it. Oh, you know, because a man's world is different from a woman's world when it comes to sexual matters. But the man must be understanding, I agree. But let me tell you, friends, a lot of men are suffering today. Men have come into my office, friends, and they break down in tears because of sexual rejection in the bedroom. And they don't want to leave the marriage. They want to stay in the relationship, but the lady does not understand. I did a study some time ago about the 10 health benefits of sexual fulfillment for the man. Friends, God knows what he's about. So take care of his needs. Amen. Well, I could say more about that. But let me ask you this, panel. Why do you take your car to the gas station? Do you drink gas? No, <laughs> you don't drink gas. Yes, but you, you give the car gas. Why do you give the car gas? Because the car needs gas. You don't need gas. What you give? <laughs> Amen. Friends, watch this. Meet his needs. It's a serious thing. Amen. Finally, finally, a man needs an attractive woman. Amen. So take up yourself. And attractive here is not only physical, because physical is also important. The Bible says, if a man looketh, a man is stimulated by sight. So take care of yourself. Amen. But guess what? That's only quarter of the pie. P-I-E-S. There are four stage fundamentals of attractiveness. What is it? Physical, intellectual, emotional, 
and spiritual attractiveness. Work on yourself. Spend time, read some good books so you can have good conversation with him. Intellectual, emotional. How do you make him feel when he is in your presence? Amen. Emotion. Do you make him feel like a pea on the seashore or do you make him feel like a superstar? Friends, I charge you today, go for it. Go for it. Meet each other's needs. Amen. And improve the intimacy in your relationship. Finally, I want to say this. What does intimacy mean? <laughs> Intimacy, into me, see. Amen. That means you are seeing inside them, their heart, their deepest needs. Hello. Know what their needs are and meet their needs. If the wife meets the husband, needs, and the husband serves the wife, then there will be no lack in the relationship. The children too will be impacted and your marriage will be a little heaven on earth. Amen. Amen. Today, we're going to take your cute questions in a little while, but I always like to have a little commitment. Friends, you say you want to make a commitment today. You say, Lord, I want to be a better. I want to make a commitment to my wife. I want to be a better husband. There's always room for improvement. And so today, if you want to make a commitment, and you say, oh, I want to start serving him. I want to start serving her. Meet their needs. Write the word better. Amen. Just write the word better in the chat below. Amen. Let me see the words coming to This is a commitment you are making. I want to be a better spouse. Amen. To my husband. A better spouse to my wife. And to make my marriage better. Just write the word better. Amen. I can see the words coming through. That's your commitment. Lord, help me to have a better relationship. Amen. Loving Father, this wonderful group of couples. I pray for them today that you hold them fast. Bind them with the cords of love that can never be broken. Fix, oh God, where there is brokenness. Mend, oh God, where there are fractures. And I pray that every marriage here today will eventually, by your grace, emerge a success story in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. God bless you, friends. It's just so great to be here today with you. All right. Let's take a few questions now. I don't know who is going to feel those questions. Um, Sister Dennis. Okay, good. All right. Thank you. All right. Thank you so very much again, um, Pastor Allen. Always so passionate, and you know, you you you've learned the art of twinning the, the presentation and almost still making it like you're preaching. But we are just going along with you. Thank you this evening for for those pointers. You know, the needs of the needs of the man, the needs of the woman, so very important. And um, we're going to take the questions now. But I just want to say that we have another 95 couples or individuals who are on YouTube. So there is the Jamaica Union Conference um, YouTube page and um, they type in, you can type in marriage enrichment seminar. And there are individuals over there also. So I'm going to ask those individuals to go ahead and post your questions in the chat there. I'll be able to feed them um, to, to Pastor Allen while trying to monitor right here on this Zoom. So we have 169 represented here on Zoom and we have another 80 odd on YouTube. Amen. All right, so they're saying now great presentation, Dr. Allen and their, Pastor Allen and their, you know, persons are making the commitment. I am yet to see a question. to see a question is there oh. any hand is there any hand uh or on the zoom platform you could just raise your hand no oh, i don't see any hand 
It was so clear as crystal. Yes, go ahead, dear. Yes, but I don't see any. Okay, there is, a, it seems like almost a French name, Monroe Elite. Go ahead. Yes, hi, Pastor Allen. That was really inspiring. I appreciate it. I have a question. My question is, what happened? What's your best advice quickly for a spouse who refuses to admit or to take responsibility for faults within a marriage? Okay. That's a very good point. Uh, spouse who find it difficult to admit faults. I want to say, friends, that it's good that that person understands this. That one of the great needs of every spouse, as I mentioned about transparency, is also vulnerability. Be vulnerable. And a lot of people sometimes are on an ego trip. Their ego is having the better of them. And because of that, that's a prescription for brokenness in the marriage. I wanna say something more that inspiration tells us, Ellen White says that if we possess humility, 95% of the issues in marriage can be solved. So I would say to that person, don't destroy your marriage by failing to admit. Because when you fail to admit your wrong, you freeze the marriage, the marriage stops. And so, you know, but if, it, if this persists and the person will not accept responsibility, of course, number one, you pray for them and so forth, but also friends seek help. Seek help because sometimes people just need to hear it from a third party. Because if they are, they are causing brokenness in their marriage, but they don't understand it. And when people marry, they must be vulnerable. They must be, they are, their soul must be an open book to each other. And so they should be able to accept their faults. But I say, if they won't um, you know, make any kind of appreciable change, then seek the help from a professional third party. Okay? All right, thank you so very much, Pastor Allen. Um, the question is being asked on the on YouTube: What happens if the if your husband keeps having affairs over and over, even to the point that two children were born outside of the marriage? Um, the whole matter of um, infidelity. Another wife is commenting on what happens if the husband defrauds his wife. Uh, what happens if he is not respectful? You know, how do, how do I still show respect? All right. You mentioned about the fraud. Now, friends, when you have those critical situations, one of the things I want to say to couples now, because many times couples are suffering in silence. It is not God's will that you should be sentenced to hardship and pain in your marriage. As, and, uh, listen now. And if you don't do something about it, listen now. If you sit back and do nothing, you are only enabling him. You are encouraging him to continue. Because many times he does not stop. So when you find these situations, don't sit back and cry every day. No, get help. Seek a professional. Seek the pastor. Seek a counselor. But friends, let me just tell you something. It's a big problem with many people, especially in the Caribbean, to go for therapy. But I want to tell you this, those of us who have gone to certain schools and so forth, we have learned over time that the more educated you are, the more you need help. <laughs> Amen. The more you see coaching. My professor, for example, while I was doing my family therapy program, my professor would always talk about her therapist. My fellow students, Always talk about, oh, I just had an appointment this weekend with my therapist. Friends, it's a way of life. When there's something happening in the marriage that we cannot handle, we seek a coach. We seek help. But guess what? It pains my heart when I see people suffering in silence in their marriage, as though that's God's will. Never. 
And especially when you're having infidelity, a man, what watch this, when you're having somebody who is being unfaithful to you. A lot of women continue to be sexually active with them. Friends, the first thing should stop. Once a man starts to be unfaithful to you, and you know that he is, he is cheating on you. The first thing you should cease to do, friends, is... <laughs> Watch this now. You cannot continue to do that without help. You see, medical help as well, because he must prove to you that he's okay. Because if you don't seek help, medical help on his part, you see, a lot of ladies need to rise up because guess what? If you behave like slave, he'll treat you like slave. You cross the line and say, listen to me, until you seek medical help and you cease doing what you're doing, shop is closed. Period. And you know why I say that? One man, for example, he was always cheating on his wife. Let me give you a little story. He came in one day with some tablets. She was still ah, moving along with him. She knows he's cheating, but every night they're yeah, moving along, meeting his sexual needs. Then one day he came in, he handed her some tablets. You know what he said to her? Take these. You're going to need them. You know what happened? He has already transferred AIDS to her. And now she's going to need them. Friends, you are not a martyr. Don't consent to suicide. Be intelligent, women, and rise up. Because if you don't do something, he's going to continue. Amen. And then you're going to die a miserable life, very likely many times. But seek help. Amen. All right, there's a question about communication. How can I find time to, how can we improve communication when we are busy working for the children and for the family? All right, you know one way to communicate, guys? It's good to have family time at home. Have a conference. You can say it twice a week. Have family time, like on a Thursday night. Eight o'clock Thursday evening, everybody meets for family time. That's number one, and you don't miss it. Also, if you can, as much as possible, friends, you must have family worship in your home, especially if you have kids. This morning I spoke on a wake up call, Holy Ghost wake up call, and I talked about the importance of renewing our minds. If you want to raise godly children, you must have family worship. For when, when you share the words with the children, that's how their minds are being renewed into holiness. You must sow the seeds of righteousness before the devil sows his thorns. Watch this now. If you don't teach them to love God, the devil will teach them to hate God. So have family. That will help you in make, making sure you have time to talk with each other. Also, go to bed early when you can. Wake up in the morning, four o'clock. My wife and I, we like to do this a lot. We have pillow talk. Sometimes we are talking from four o'clock <laughs> until seven o'clock. Then my wife said, what? Especially from Sunday mornings, you know? Oh, I said, you know, I've been talking for three hours. Wow. And it's just fun. So friends, have what you call pillow talk. So plan time to spend with each other. All right. Um, what 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 can you say to women who see intimacy as one of the uh, as an item on the to do list? Okay, women who see intimacy as an item on the to do list. What do you mean? Mm -hmm. That's I'm not sure that is. Okay. I, I guess it's, it's, it is it is like a chore, just something to get done. Oh. Not necessarily that they are enjoying. That that's my interpretation of it. Just something to get done to tick right. off the, the next item on the list to tick off. Right, oh, okay. Let me tell you something. You should, wife and husband should come to the place where they, watch this now, they are free to talk about sexual issues. They talk about it free. A lot of men sometimes don't talk about it because they don't have the vocabulary. I would say go and read some books so you can talk. Some ladies too, based on past trauma, they don't want to talk about it. But friend, that's affecting your marriage. Watch this now. 
sexual match, sex, when it comes to sex, listen, it either bring you together or separate you. So those issues must be addressed. All right, so number one, wife and husband must get involved. Listen now, I wish I had time to talk to the men too because men and women see sexual matters differently. Watch this now, men. You must understand a woman when it comes to sex. Watch this now. Intimacy for the woman does not begin at 10 p.m. when you jump into bed. <laughs> no, but at 10 a.m. when you jump out of bed. What does that mean? That means you are, you are romancing. Listen to me. You are romancing her heart all day. Amen. <laughs> For a woman, watch this. A woman, her psychological nature and her sexual nature are closely intertwined. Mm -hmm. They are inseparable. So watch this now, watch this now. So if you wound her psychologically, she cannot respond to sex well. In other words, sex for her is painful, drudgery. As a matter of fact, let me tell you something. There's a saying that sex without intimacy feels like rape. What does that mean? She must be prepared for it mentally. You cannot treat her badly and expect her body to respond. No, she's frozen. And when she's frozen there, it's painful. And so a lot of men who need to understand how a woman views sex, okay? A lot of time when there's sexual issues in the marriage, it's not the sex. It is the marital issues. Because if she's not happy, if she's not happy in her mind, it's going to be a drudgery in the bedroom for her. So treat her well all day if you want her to respond well at 10 p.m. I hope that helps. I don't have much time to go into all the details, but I just want to share that. Yes. Yes, thank you so very much. Thank you so very much, Pastor. What happened? Well, last one, what to do when the husband is the one who is not into sex? All right. Listen now, friends. If the husband is the one who is not into sex, and let me just tell you something. When we talk about low libido, who is going to the store many times for medication? Many times, you know, the man is the issue. When the man finds that he's, he has a problem, number one, the woman should help him. They should talk about it. And then she can say, you know, honey, I think you should go to the doctor, seek help. Exactly, he should seek help, but don't sit back and do nothing about it. Because guess what? She married to have her needs met. Amen. And you must find a way. And let me say also, friends, Meeting her sexual needs is not only, is not always by penetration, okay? It has a lot to do with romance. There are so many different ways about it. Are you with me? So the point is, though, the man should seek help and advice because he has a duty. He has a duty to enhance the relationship, even as it relates to meeting her needs. Amen. And she should help him. She should not bash him. That would make it worse. She should love him and say, honey, I know we seem to have a problem. Can we talk about it? What can I do? Do you know there's a lot a woman can do to help him? They should talk about it together. That is it. All right. Thank you so very much. Thank you so very much, Pastor Allen. Um, just want to, because some persons feel like, you know, some of their, the, the, the questions that they've asked, they, they've not gotten their specific responses. But um, earlier, um, Pastor Allen would have mentioned in cases of you know, being defraud and infidelity, there are just some things that require you to go forth and see a therapist. He cannot in this, um, in this space, having not heard the full story, right. give you a prescription. Yes, yes. <laughs> And so the encouragement here is that you, you, you see a counselor, that you see a therapist in order to get some specialized attention for your particular 
situation. I know I see persons writing to say, can we have a part three? I'm asking, um, I'm gonna ask uh, Pastor Dennis, I'm gonna ask Dr. Dennis or ask uh, the technical team, please to repost the, 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 the review, the, what's it called? The evaluation form. The evaluation form. Could it be please be posted on the YouTube, posted back in the chat because persons are not seeing it, and possibly from this, oh, then you will know oh. how to plan, how next, how how next to plan, so that more. Okay. Um, I am posting can. it in the what's in the Zoom platform. I will have to ask um Christoph the evaluation form. If you could post it for me, please in the um youtube uh because i i keep seeing the question i was wondering if they're not seeing it in the zoom so we're not, I, we're not seeing it it's in the zoom platform so the, those who are on zoom just click on that w you see there that's where the evaluate there's a w there um on zoom just click on that and it will open those who are on youtube i'm going to ask christoph if, if it's, it's possible to to post it there i am on it i'm not on the youtube platform at this time Okay. All right. So they'll sort out that um, uh, as it relates to the to the evaluation form, and then we will know how best to plan for you um, for the future. I see your request. I see persons asking for more. And I know that this evening we really could stay here and continue to go on and on and on. But um, thank you again so very much, Pastor Allen. I'm going to at this time allow for uh, Elder George Allen, uh, Elder George Gordon, and Sister Kendria to go ahead and do their 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 special song, and then we'll be able to move into the next presentation. Love you guys. <laughs> There's no sound here. The children of Israel, many times before, because you are the open door. I read how you led them through the Red Sea with all your might and majesty. Yes, I 
Welcome back to Heart to Heart Connection. I want to thank you for joining us this week. Last week we had a wonderful experience and I want to thank Pastor Allen and Sister Allen for their kind contribution and for the presentation today also. Uh, we are going to be looking at family resource management. 25% of marriages that break up, break up as a result of issues over family finance. This is an important matter that must be dealt with. And so I'm going to invite you now to join me on screen. I know that there were some comments and concerns that were raised, and we have structured the program today. One of them is that you'd like for us to answer some of your questions. And so we have structured the program so that we will allow for time for some question and answer. I hope that that will assist in supporting your relationship. So thanks to Dr. Nathan, Dr. Eric Nathan, my friend, and for the devotional exercise. And thanks for, uh, to Pastor Blythe, who did the devotional exercise last week. Thank you so much. Thanks to all the couples for joining us from all over the world. Special thanks to the Belize uh, Union for your support. Let's get into the presentation. Um, I am coming to you from uh, the Dominican Republic. My wife is there in Jamaica and she will help to guide us through. Thank you so much, Keisha, for your wonderful support. All right, let's get into the presentation at this time. I'm going to share my screen with you as we deal with this very, very important topic, family resource management. All right. So let's, all right. So we have a definition here of family resource management as an understanding of the decisions individuals and families make about developing and allocating resources, including time, money, material assets, energy, friends, neighbors, and space to meet their goals. And this definition is not unique to the church. As a matter of fact, this definition comes from the National Council on Family Relationships from the, of the United States. So, all our resources that we have can accrue to the benefit of the family. I think the problem that we have is like, we, we, we like to complain about what we don't have. Now, today's presentation is to say, identify what you have, appreciate what you have, and maximize what you have for your personal benefit and for the benefit of your family. And I would add to that, to glorify the name of the Lord. So it's not just for your benefit and for your family's benefit, I'm going to put in my pointer here, but it is also for the benefit of the, the, the family, sorry, it is also to glorify the name of the Lord. All right, so we said that there are 
external resources and internal resources. Um, so we look at the internal resources first. The internal resources includes your talents, your skills, your life experience, uh, and, and I must say your life experience where you grow up, the, what you have been through can determine what you bring to the marriage. So, so there are some persons who are coming with the asset that their parents were married, their grandparents were married and they were taught family resilience and stick to itiveness. They some are coming with the asset that their families brought them up in the church and they are used to the culture of family worship. And so these are things that you bring. There are some who comes with, uh, you know, with I, I don't know if you, you want to, you know, I, I, there's a term in my head that is, you know, baggage. And I don't mean it in a in a bad way, but there are some persons who are coming with some negative experiences like domestic violence that you might need to seek professional help in order to resolve so that you can have quality relationship. So the experiences that you have been through can be an asset to the marriage, your money, your vehicle, your home, uh, you, you, the quality relationship you have been in and that you share with others at this time. And I want to touch on this one before I move to external resources, your personality and your temperament. Some persons have some bad personality. Now, personality is wide because in psychology, we we look at the, 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 there's, 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 there are several um, authors that relates to different types of personality. Um, there is the big five and, 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 and there is the, the 16 personalities and so on that talks about uh, uses whether you are um, emotional or whether you are, are introvert or extrovert or, or you know various whether you are judging or you know and, and, and so on various aspects of your being to determine who you are personality is wider than temperament all the personality studies include temperament i, I like to talk about temperament uh, you know so so as i said personality will determine whether you're moody or uh, whether you're outgoing or reserved or whether you 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 are reason reasoning or, or or judging and so on but temperament has to do with whether you are reserved or outgoing. Now that can be an asset to your relationship. Some people allow it to be uh, um, a negative for them, but it can be a positive. For, for example, uh, complementarity is the term we normally use when opposites attract one another. Compatibility when similarities determine your choice. Now, uh, compatibility um, speaks to the fact that, uh, sorry, complementarity speaks to the fact that oftentimes the, the outgoing like to marry the reserve. For example, the sanguine, who is the life of the party, would normally want to marry a, 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 a melancholy who is reserved, organized, and structured because the sanguine is not normally structured. The sanguine is the life of the, of the party. They run the social, they can think on their feet, but oftentimes in doing so, they make mistakes and often have to apologize. Now, the, 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 this can be an asset for both because the reserved person who will never use the platform to preach or to run the social um, can help behind the scenes to organize and structure the social and help to calm down the sanguine a little bit. And the sanguine can help to pull out the uh, melancholic a little bit and help them to have fun. So you can use it as an asset to benefit your relationship. But some persons who are melancholic, who are not outgoing, are jealous and and, 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 and saying, I can't preach, I can't teach, and so I'm less off. I'm not outgoing, so I'm less off. Don't think that you are less off. Look at what benefit you can bring to the table. And the sanguine might look at the melancholy and, 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 and say, 
boy, you know, uh, you know, uh, uh, sometimes I make too much noise, so I, I want to be quiet. Yes, you might need to calm down a little bit, but but we need you because Roy Dennis is not a sanguine, and if it's left up to him, no social will be kept at church. But social needs to be kept in order to uh, cause the people to come together. And so you can pull out the melancholic and pull out the choleric and pull out the phlegmatic and get them involved in social activities. So identify those things that are your resources internally. External resources are all those things around you that can support your marriage and your relationship, includes the police station, whether they have vehicles or not, um, the fire station, how far it is away from your home, your friendship network, your extended family support, Support, the medical facilities, whether it gives good quality medical services, your church, what type of church you worship at, your, your, your community center, your citizen association, the library, the internet, um, all of those, the natural resources that you have around you. And I live in a nice community where it's a farming community and uh, you know we have sheep, we have goats, we have cattle, we have horses, we have uh, uh, chicken farms, Arms. We have agrarian, uh, uh, you know, communities there where they plant uh, pepper and sweet pepper and, and all sorts of uh, things. And so when I walk in the mornings, when I do get to walk, it's just a joy to be in that natural environment. So still, we, we need we need family members need to identify what we have. So stop complaining about what you don't have and give God praise for what you have and maximize it. All right, so um, life, my dear friends, and we're zero, zeroing in now on uh, financial resources um, because of time. Uh, life, my friends, can be joyful and we must live life to abundance. Some people are waiting until after they retire to live. I am saying live now because Sometimes by the time you get re retired, um, sickness comes, your health is not there anymore. If that's the time you're waiting to drive a nice car, um, if that's the time you're waiting to, to build your house when you're 65, uh, maybe that time it's late. So, so for me, I, I had a goal that by 40, I wanted to be married. I wanted to have children. I wanted to, to, to do my doctorate degree. I wanted to drive a new car. And, 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 and thank God, um, maybe it took a little longer to drive a new car, but, but thank God, all of those have been accomplished. And I, I feel that if I die now, I would have lived. So uh, while you're not overextending yourself, if you overextend yourself and, and you take out loans that you can't repay, you're going to be under stress. So live within your means, but live. Some people hoard away the money and put it away and they have millions in the bank and they die leave it. And the children just spend it up and sometimes squander it away. So while you are saving and securing your future, you must find the balance so that you can eat and drink and live and take care of your health. All right? So we must remember that God wants us to live a life in abundance. Uh, he wants us to prosper. Bible says he wants us to prosper and to be in good health. The Bible says that he has given us the power to make wealth so that we can have resources to take care of our families. As we receive these resources, there are three types of money plans that I want to share, and then I will close. Three types. Of, the one boss plan, and, you know, and, and, and how to manage the money. That's what we're looking at. The one boss plan, the two boss plan, and the budget plan three different types of plan that we operate our own. The one boss plan is where one person manages the money. The husband may be the person or the wife may be the person. Growing up, the culture was that most of the times the wives would be the person to manage the funds. In today's society, we find that more and more men are managing the resources. So the resources are pooled and managed either by the wife or the husband. The better financier, the better planner, the one who has the mind for it is the person who should manage and the other person would work with them and support it. All right? 
So the one boss plan says, this is, so my money is my money and your money is my money. One person manage the resources. All right, that's the one boss plan. Then uh, the two boss plan, going to move to the two boss plan because of time. The two boss plan says, my money is my money and your money is your money. Not the difference. In the one boss plan, one person manages the fund. In the two boss plan, both persons manage their resources. Now, in the two boss plan, that's what most of the households in Jamaica operate on. So, so the individual works their money and they, they might decide who pays which bills. Income is kept a secret, so my wife don't know of how much I work and I, I, I don't know how much she works. They, they decide on who pays which expenses, so we might decide I pay the light bill, my wife pay the water bill. I pay the school fee, my wife pay the rent, or so on. Uh, so the, it is decided who pays which bill. And then now, um, often, don't ask me any question. In this plan, you should have, in this plan, you can have a wealthy husband and a poor wife. A wealthy husband and a poor wife. Or a wealthy wife and a poor husband. How does this work? All right. So I work $100,000. My wife work, work $50,000. Let's, let's use that, 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 that ballpoint figure. So, so, so uh, um, we say, all right. For every bill, you pay a half, I pay a half. All right. So, so for the for the water bill, it comes up to 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 ten thousand dollars. She pays a half, I pays a half. So when you deduct the five thousand from her salary, fifty thousand, she's left with forty five thousand. Well, 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 she returns her tithes and offering five thousand and so on. So she's left with forty thousand. I return my tithes and offering. Let's say that's ten thousand. So uh, I'm sorry. Let's let's say that's twenty thousand. So I am left with eighty thousand. My wife is left with forty thousand. The water bill comes up. And let's say all the bills comes up to to. To 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 forty thousand, she pays twenty thousand. I pay twenty thousand. So I am now left with sixty thousand. My wife is left with twenty thousand. Uh, the, the 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 her travel expenses to work comes up to twenty five thousand. So now she is in a minus. My travel expenses uh, amount to thirty thousand. Uh, so I am left with 30,000. And, and so by the middle of the month, my wife is saying, Roy, can you give me $5,000 to help to pay my fear? Because she's operating her finance. And then I'm going to say to her, didn't you get paid two weeks ago? You know, so, so you could have in that scenario, a wealthy husband, because I have 30,000 to play with. I can eat on the road. And, and I can go out with my friends and my wife is under distress. Or you could reverse the script because some women work more money than the men and the woman works the 100,000 and the man is a mason. She has a degree and he works 50,000. And so um, he pays a half, she pays a half and it ends up that his money finishes in the middle of the month. And you know the society expects that the man is to be the main breadwinner. So he's under severe distress. And sometimes he doesn't want to come home. And the wife starts saying he has women out there. But it's because he feels um, that he is unable to carry his responsibility. This is not God's plan for the family. And it violates the, the principle of marriage. What is that principle? The Bible says that they are no longer two, but one flesh. This one fleshness my friends, is not only talking about sexual unity, where the husband and the wife are joined together in the deepest level of intimacy that can be found on earth. That's what sexual unity is. But it's talking about being unified in, in every aspect of life. There must be unity in communication. There must be unity in parenting. There must be unity with the use of your finances. And, and so there are many couples who are willing to share their, their, their communication and to share their parenting skills, and, but they are not willing to share, and they share their bodies, but they are not willing to share their pocketbook. They are not willing to share their money. And, and, and we are living in a culture in Jamaica, I don't know about the other countries represented here, but in Jamaica, the culture says that the man must take care of the woman. 
And I am saying in today's society, we have to change that. Where both persons work, especially that 65% of the top jobs in Jamaica are taken by women who have degrees, then where both the man and the woman works, both are co breadwinner. So it, what this means is that both must take care of the duties in the home. The man must not think that the woman who goes out there and work nine to five must come home and do everything in the home. The man must share with the home duties and the woman must share with the finances. So they are co-homemakers and co-breadwinners. It is not contrary to the biblical principles. In the Bible, the man was the sole breadwinner, the only one who worked except when the woman is a widow or unmarried. So the woman would not work, she would take care of, she was a sole homemaker while the man was the sole breadwinner. That principle, my friend, is not a salvific one. It, is, it has nothing to do with salvation. It had to do with the culture where the men were prepared academically to work. Now the women are also prepared more so than the men in the Jamaican society. And when the women work, they should not think that, all right, the culture says the man should take care of me. So I work more, but I'm going to hide that away. I'm going to give that to my extended family and the man must provide everything. It cannot work that way. The man and the woman must pull their resources together for the benefit of the family. That way, you don't have a wealthy wife and a poor husband or a wealthy husband and a poor wife. But if they are poor, they are poor together. And if they are wealthy, they are wealthy together. All right, so that's plan B. Plan C is, is, is where you see that I have been heading, where the resources are pooled and a budget is made. And I want to refer to this as a budget plan. So in this plan, it is not my money or your money, but it is our money. So my money becomes your money and your money becomes my money. This is the plan where resources are pooled. You make a budget and use it. Now, who manages the budget? I mentioned that the better financier, sometimes it's a woman, sometimes it's a man. All right. Uh, it is our income. Major expenses are decided on together. The budget is created together and getting into debt requires a joint decision. In the two boss plan, sometimes the man says, because I work more money than my wife, that's the two boss plan now. I can buy a car and surprise my wife. I, I don't need to tell her. I just drive home at SUV. But maybe the wife didn't want you to buy a new car because she's pregnant and you only live in a two-bedroom house and you have two children already. And she was thinking that maybe we could build another room and you go and buy a brand new car. It's going to create problem in the family. In the two boss plan, what we find is that many times the woman wants to upgrade herself academically and she, with a bachelor's degree, decides I'm going to do a master's degree that costs the family $4 million over a two-year period and I don't need to tell my husband, I just start this program because I work more money than he does. But it will affect the family finances and it will affect the time that you have available to your family. So major decisions must be made together. We decide collectively on, on, on savings. We decide collectively on spending. This is God's plan, that there be communication. <clears throat> Pardon me. That there be collaboration, right? That you pool your resources together. Is there an exception to this budget plan rule? Yes. Because some persons might say, oh, but I have a situation. Now, if you have a situation, it's a situation. And the exception is not the rule. The rule is that you work with a budget plan. But there are situations in which you are in a home. Maybe your spouse is not a Christian. Uh, and, and they don't believe some of these philosophies. And if they are online, I'm hoping that they are learning the principles and will apply them. So you might have a situation where you have a spendthrift who when you pull the resources together and both your names are on the bank account, the person will go and they cannot control themselves and they will spend off the money and drag the family down in poverty. In that case, um, I, 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 and I think about my own home growing up where my father was not a Christian, my mother was a Christian, and he would get drunk 
and, 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 and the girls would take away the money. So what my mother had to do is to hide away the money from him. And sometimes when, 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 so he would take the money home and he would, and my mother would have to hide it away to make sure that he has fear, bus fear to go to work on a daily basis so that he can continue to provide for the family. And my mother would manage the finance, the little finances so that food is in the house and so on. So if you have somebody who will, will squander the money away, um, you will have to take action so that you protect and secure the family. The problem we have is that couples go in to the marriage hiding away their resources already and and you can trust your spouse if you have a trustworthy spouse and you hide the resources you are breaching the trust but when you have an untrustworthy spouse you may need to hide away some to protect the family i, I hope you're understanding what i'm saying don't hide the money if you can trust your spouse declare it and declaring it does not mean that you're necessarily going to hand over everything because in the budget you can say all right since my wife is studying we're going to have this account that she will put a part a portion of her salary or the husband might even put a portion of the salary there and this is for the academic preparation so that so bear that in mind so it's the clearing and the sharing your resources so in this plan we must remember that the resources that we get come from God. And I must touch this one because for your resources to be blessed, we must put God first. We must remember that God is the owner of everything. The Bible says in Haggai 2 verse 8, the silver is mine and the gold is mine, says the Lord of hosts. Listen to this. Honor the Lord with your possession and with the first fruit. With the what? The first fruit of your increase so shall your barns be filled with plenty and your presses shall burst out with new wine proverbs 3 verses 9 and 10 and uh, matthew 6 verse 33 one of my favorite scriptures seek first the kingdom of god and his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you listen to ellen g white uh you know in review and heralds those who are ready and willing to invest in the cause of god will be blessed in their effort to acquire money it is not a sin to acquire and control property as stewards of god holding it only until he requires it for the necessities of his work so what she's saying here is that and she says it in this way in another way in another article she says anytime you return to the lord when he blesses you he will bless you some more well, here she's saying god wants to bless us but if he blesses us we should be faithful to him so in the budget that i send out to premarital for premarital counseling that every couple almost 300 marriages that i have done not one couple have married without them giving me a budget they need to show how they are going to finance this business marriage is a business operation and it will go under if you cannot finance it so if, i'm not telling you where to live i'm not telling you what type of car to drive if you drive a car but I am saying, if you are going to get married and you're going to ride a bicycle and you're going to live in a one bedroom house, a studio apartment, how are you going to maintain that? And you will find that some persons can finance a four bedroom house and uh, a, 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 an SUV while another person cannot afford a bicycle and a one bedroom house. So you should be able to finance your marriage and make a decision how you're going to live. So I am required to be a steward and to be faithful. And remember, up top in your budget, you must return your tithes and offering. That's how God blesses you. A single woman demonstrate how to put God first. We know the story with, uh, in, in 1 Kings chapter 17, 10 to 16, how Elijah, um, how Elijah, uh, 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 you know, when he was running from uh, Jezebel and Ahab, uh, you know, how, how God provided for, for, for Elijah by this woman, this, this, this widow of Zarephath. And she, 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 God said, 
she, the prophet went to her and said, uh, all right, you." She, they had a little flower and she says, I'm going to make uh, two dumplings for my son and myself and then I'm going to eat, we're just going to eat and die. But the prophet came to her household and said, listen, the Lord has shown me that you should make a dumpling for me too. So divide it now into three and, and give me a dumpling first. And then you make one for your son and yourself. And the woman did not say, no, the dumpling already too small. The flower already too small. She said, because God has said it, I will do it. And the Bible says that she did what God says. And God blessed her that all through that famine, the barrel was never empty. Right? So, in, so, so we need to be faithful to God. Second principle of setting up the budget is invest wisely. Proverbs chapter 4, verse 7 says, Wisdom is the principal thing. Therefore, get wisdom. And with all thy getting, get understanding. By investment, we are saying, uh, wisely, we are saying, don't, you, you need to take some risk when you're investing. And, and I listened to Pastor Howard Grant on the uh, CJC online platform doing the offertory. Nice analogy there that he did when he spoke about the East Indian mango tree. You plant a seed and, it, and, and you get so much mangoes for the tree. Investment means using the little that you have and putting it in a safe place where it can produce more for you. But there are some persons now who go extravagant and lose what they have. So the higher the gain, the higher the risk. The lower the gain, the lower the risk. Put your investment in a secure place. I remember when they had this place, and I can call the name because um, it was public and it went down cash plus. And there are many of these schemes that Adventists like to gravitate to. And a young man came to me and said, Pastor, um, do you have any money? And I said, for the family, I said, yes. At the time, my wife and I had our little $50,000 that we were saving for years. You know, 50000 didn't make you a wealthy person, but we were on our way trying to prepare to buy our own home. And he came to me and he said, do you have any? I said, yes. He said, he said how much you have? I said, $50,000. He said, listen, give me the $50,000 and I will take it to a place where in one month you can get another fifty on it and you will have $100,000. And I looked at him and I laughed and I said to him, have you made that type of investment? And he said, yes. And I said, how much you put in? He said, I put in 100,000. I said, how much you have? He said, he's already made another 100,000. So I said, you have 200,000 years there. And he said, yes. I said, you, if you know what I know, go and take out the profit, which is $100,000, and put it somewhere else before that system goes down. Because if you allow every, it to go down, you will lose all your money. Because I said, there is no bank or no legitimate investment that can give you 100% on your money in one month. I, I, and I said, to, and it's not very risky. I said, not even gambling, horse racing would give you that type of money. And I said, I will not do that. And he said, no, you can do it. And he said, I am sure. And he said, you don't even have to tell your wife. That's where it's putting me in trouble now. Because when I do that investment and my money goes down, my wife would leave me. I would disappoint her. And the truth being told, that young man kept the money, rolling it over, and lost all his money in that system. There are many persons, even some online, who could attest that, that for, for some, if you, are, if you are the first person, because what they're doing is using, you bring 10 persons, so you are getting money from those 10 persons. So those who are upfront, they will get a big gain and then after a while, everybody else will lose. There was another thing called Melaleuca. And those things, we like to, we are, Adventists are too gullible to these things. Put your money in wise investment. One of the best investments that you can make is in property. Um, in most countries, property appreciate. So if you invest in housing and, and if you invest in land, especially at good location, that's good investment. And that's where you can multiply your money threefold in five years, right? So, and you don't lose it, right? So, so save. Remember the story of the ants 
And you can read the passages on your own time. Proverbs chapter 6, verses 6 to 8, because this is not a sermon. Proverbs 6, verses 6 to 8, but it's biblically based because this is, a, this is the church that we are talking to. Um, I say, learn the lesson from the ants. The wise ants save consistently. One of the ways that you can save consistently is through salary deduction. So you can allow the money to come out like the taxes before you get your paycheck. You don't miss it. You don't know that you get it, but you know your account somewhere is growing. You put it where you can access it when you want to get it. Wise people do likewise. Jesus asked this question in Luke 14, 28 to 30. We're talking about investment. Which of you intending to build a tower does not sit down and first count the cost, whether he has enough to finish it? After he has laid the foundation and is not able to finish, all who see it begins to mock him. This man begins to build and was not able to finish. In other words, Jesus is saying, we must have a plan. And the budget is a plan. If you're going to make an investment, you must have a, a budget plan. If you're going to build a house, you must have a plan. One of the things that pains my heart when I walk around the island or drive around the island is to see some 17-bedroom house, some five-bedroom house, some 10-bedroom house that reaches Bell Coast. You know what Bell Coast is? When you reach that section that you're just about to put on the roof and have no windows and doors and trees take them over and bush take them over and the owner is never able to, fill them, to finish them. It's a monstrosity in certain communities and i think to myself why didn't they draw a plan where they could do this building in stages if you're building a 10 bedroom house and some people one person live in a 10 bedroom house if you're living in a 10 bedroom house why not build three bedrooms in a way that you can expand when you want without knocking out or knocking down. Maybe you could put a little part that you might have to knock out too, but it's not knocking down the whole thing. Uh, uh, you know, uh, you might have to close off that section until you're ready and you just cut a door somewhere, uh, like when we were expanding. We just cut a door from a window and we move, uh, and we finish the section that we are adding on the two bedroom. And 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 and, and we it, by the time we build the, 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 the third bedroom, it was closed up around the two bedroom. And, and when we are ready, we were still safe because the room and the, the bathroom and everything, and there was a walkway in between, was built around it outside. And when we were ready, we just cut one of the windows into a door. Uh, inside, nobody knew that we were moving in the other side. And we just move over to the other side because we had a plan. Right? So finish three bedrooms, rent it out, and get some income. Or you can sell it after a while. But when you have 10 bedrooms unfinished on a property and you want to sell back to get back the money that you have spent, nobody will buy that. So what are the budget guidelines? This is the final thing I'm going to deal with now, guidelines for the budget. Budget is a receipt that has a recipe rather that helps us to plan our giving, our spending, and our saving. Three things about the budget you need to bear in mind here. It involves your, 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 your receiving, your, your saving, and your spending. Uh, so uh, what are some of the things that we spend on? In the Christian budget, we must expect the first person we must return to, as we established before, is God. Adventists need to return their tithes and offering. If you rob God, you are robbing yourself of blessings. Uh, daily activities. Eat good food. Don't go and waste your money on expensive restaurants that you cannot afford. You may need to go to expensive restaurants as a couple once in a while. So don't say, Pastor, then you say you must not go to expensive restaurants. If you can afford it and you need to go to the hotel once in a while. As somebody said to me, say, Pastor, I have learned that a wife at a hotel is a different wife from the wife at home. So maybe every couple, if you can afford it, need to go to a hotel with your spouse at least once per year or a nice restaurant, you know. But if you try to do that every month or every week, it might put you in poverty. So daily activities. Provide for your food, you know, school fee for the children and so on. Major events, your wedding, uh, you would have to plan for that. Your, your graduation, uh, 
you know, improving on your, your your quality of your education, going back to school and so on. Then there is special event, you know, so you plan for these um, occasions um, in your budget. The budget should be balanced. That what does a balanced budget means? It means that your expenses are less than your income, so you get more than you spend. If you if you spend more than you get, your budget budget is is not balanced, can't be balanced. But if you get more, then you can balance it by putting the rest to savings and what we I normally call miscellaneous, which is any emergency that will come up. So you have a balanced budget by making sure that you get more than you spend right god is a part of your income personal allowances for husband and wife and children must be included and also gifts for the needy right if you're going to give to family members put that in the budget uh, the better financier should manage the budget so so that's family resource management and especially the managing of your finances i want to encourage couples that you identify your resources and we have indicated that the resources they are not only uh they are not only financial resources that we focus on but your resources are internal resources which include your personality and your time and so on and, and the experiences that you have been to and that you have external resources which is the support system around you including your church and school identify what you have maximize on them invest them uh, uh, to benefit your family and to glorify god i close with this story which you know we we were told that the king of egypt when 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 joseph was down there pharaoh had a dream that he he, he could not interpret about the fat cows and the meager cows and and joseph interpreted the dream to say oh, they're going to come at um, seven years of plenty and then there's going to come seven years of uh, difficulties, uh, like like the the, the 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 collapse of the financial system some years ago, and 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 always after you have years of plenty, you're going to you're going to have that's the cycle in life. You're going to have years of difficulties. So what we should do when we are having the years of plenty, eat good food, yes, live, drive a good car. Um, expand on your house if you can can afford to but don't leave out the savings learn from the ants that you need to put aside something for major events prepare for life and prepare for death prepare for expanding on your education for improving on your skills and ability because by doing so you you put yourself in a better capacity to continue to to get wealth uh, uh, prepare for death that you don't leave your spouse in poverty Maybe you need to take out, a, 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 you know, an insurance like like the Cumna Mutual at the conference and your local church to cover your spouse. So to so put the, the five thousand that it costs and the six thousand to cover yourself so that your spouse can get a million dollars if and when you should die. So during the years of plenty, drive a good car, eat and so on, but plan your budget that you can save enough to secure your future. May God bless all the couples online that you will pool your resources, that you will invest wisely in your marriage and family, and more so that you will invest in the kingdom of God. God bless you. Amen. All right, so that's, that's a presentation. I'm looking at the time that we are a little bit over 7.30. Um, so we are going to, I'm just going to take maybe two questions if we have any, and then I will take the five minutes more to take you through the recommitment. Uh, my wife is not feeling so well. She had a long week and a long weekend. And so I will just have to take it from here. Um, all right. All right. Um, Okay, do we have any questions? Just raise your hand. Um, let me see if I can pick up that feature when it comes up. If you have any questions, and I will take them at this time. Or just, you can put it in the chat if anything. 
All right, I'll just wait for a minute. If there are any questions on family resource management or any other question on the marriage and family that you would want to ask at this time. Okay, if not, I'm gonna move now to our commitment. I'm sharing my screen here. We're gonna ask the couples just to be beside each other at this time. Oh, we have one question. Let me take this question and then we go to the commitment. Please, I'm um, gonna ask um, that you open your mic, uh, Fitzroy Donaldson, I think, and you might go ahead and ask the question at this time. All right, Fitzroy Donaldson. You could go ahead and ask a question. If you're unable to open your microphone, you could just put it in the chat. Let me see if it's in the chat. How do how do you convince your spouse to change from hiding paycheck to sharing? This <laughs> how do you convince your spouse? Um, well, first of all, I be believe from, from premarital and premarital counseling is important that I normally, we normally go through that with the couples to ensure that the principle that they follow is that both persons would declare and reveal what they get and that the resources will be shared. Now, um, I understand that there are various circumstances and I saw where someone um, place in the chat that sometimes their spouse is not an Adventist and don't believe in returning tithes and offering and so on. So we have those circumstances and it shouldn't be a matter of convincing the person. Um, I think educating and uh, the person and, and the person educating themselves as to how to operate. I mentioned that the ideal is that resources should be shared, should be pooled um, together uh, and so you would not need to convince a person if they are of the same conviction as you are as Seventh-day Adventists and believing in the principles of marriage and so on. So you would not need to convince them. If they are not equipped um, and educated in that way, if they are not a Seventh-day Adventist, you can, you can sit together and discuss it and, and, and the person can be educated in that regard. As I said also that there are circumstances when persons would not want to declare and share their resources if they do not trust you. And you might not want to do that if you don't trust them. So trust is an important part of the process also. So education and building the trust is important and key towards declaring and sharing the resources. All right. So I hope that I answered that question. I see Fitzroy Donaldson's hand is up. I don't know if you, you want to ask a question. You could open your microphone and do so. Okay, good evening, everyone. Good evening. Right, I want to ask, what if your salary deduction, right, is so much that when you get your net pay, it is not sufficient to cover your tithe? Yes. All right. Thank you very much. And, and we get that question all the time. Um, one of the things that the government ensures is that they take their, their, their portion up front. So um, you won't have the chance to, you only like your institution sometimes don't remit to the government what they should get. But the government portion comes off the top. So the recommendation is that God's portion must come off the top. That is to say that you plan for it even before you plan for other expenses. All the expenses that comes from your salary deduction, you made a decision. For example, on my salary, I pay for my car. I may pay NHT for the house. You decide what type of, if you can afford to buy a house and still return your tithe. So every time my wife and I, because we drive two cars, we go two different directions. She's in her profession, I'm in mine. Um, uh, we every time we are purchasing a car, we look at what type of car we can buy based on the salary that we are getting. So if I cannot afford to pay 150000 to drive an X6, um, I should not go for an X6. If what I can afford is to pay 40000 to purchase a Honda Fit, 
and return my tithes. That's what I should do. So don't try to buy a three bedroom house in a gated community when you won't be able to buy food, you won't be able to return your tithe and so on. So the expenses that come on your salary, they are as a result of your decision. God blesses you with 100,000. You're going to look at it and you're going to say, if God blesses me with 100,000, can I afford a car? What type of car can I afford? And still be faithful to God. So in your planning, don't overextend yourself on personal benefits that you cannot be faithful to God. All right. Thank you. All right. So couples get together now. We're going to ask you and those who can open your microphones. We're going to ask, not your microphones, your cameras. You can feel free now to open your cameras. Those of you who can uh, for this portion, um, you feel free to open your cameras, not your microphones um, as we go through this commitment together. All right. All right, couples. I don't. I I don't see the couples open. Yes, open up your camera. Let me see what the couples are doing here now. As far as you can, I know some couples might not be able to open your cameras. Um, you have been there uh, behind the screen for a long time, and we have not been able to see you. But if you are able to open your cameras, we're going to ask the couples to get together and open your cameras as we go through the vows together. Okay. All right, dearly beloved, we are gathered here today in the sight of God and in the presence of these witnesses to re renew and reaffirm the marriage vows of all these couples. You were joined together by God. It is his will that you should never part. The past has brought joys and sorrows, but the race is not for the swift, but those who will endure to the end. God has given you a new start. This is your commitment now, so you will respond in your homes. Will you therefore pledge anew today to love, comfort, honor, cherish your spouse in sickness, and in health, and be faithful till death. Say, I do. Okay. Husbands, you will look your wife in the eyes at this time. You look your wife in the eyes at this time, and you will say after me, husbands to the wife, today we celebrate a rebirth of our commitment. Before this honored gathering, I take you once again, husbands, saying to the wife, I take you once again to be my wife. I am sorry for my past mistakes. I want you to be my best friend. I will love you with all my heart, and you cannot outlove me till death do us part. All right, that's your husband. Wife's commitment to the husband now, looking the husband in the eyes. You will say after me, wives, today we celebrate a rebirth of our commitment before this honored gathering. Wives, I take you once again to be my husband. I am sorry for my past mistakes. I want you to be my best friend. I will love you and you cannot outlove me. Till death do us part. All right, so we are going to pray at this time. Bow your heads with me as we pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for these two afternoons that we have been able to share together. Some were not able to join last week, but they are with us this week. And these couples, we continue the process of education and equipping. So many things have been discussed. We pray that husbands will know and understand what their wives need 
and wives will know and understand what their husbands need so that we will continue to give emotional support to one another. Pray that there will be effective communication and conflict resolution among the couples represented here. And where we have not been doing what we should, we pray that today, having heard, we will come up higher. I pray, Heavenly Father, that you will visit every one of these homes represented. Help us not to defraud one another in any way. Help us not just to focus on what we can get, but what we can give and how we can make the marriage and the family a better place. We pray that the love of Jesus Christ will reign in our hearts and in our homes. Beat back the forces of the enemy. The devil hates the marriage. His intention is to destroy every home because he recognized that it is the foundation of the church, the foundation of the society. So we pray, Heavenly Father, that we will be wise and that we will ensure that every day that we present our spouse, our husband, our wife, our children to the Lord at the family altar, that worship will burn high in our home. Help us that anything that is preventing us from spending quality time together, from having pillow talk with one another, from loving one another, that we will remove it from our space so that we will restore our home and our relationship. Oh God, some of us have done some terrible things. We have hurt our spouse. Help us to be willing to say, I am sorry. Because it is better, as Dr. Nathan mentioned, it is better to do what it takes to save the marriage than to lose it because we are not willing to do what it takes. So, Lord, we pray your blessing upon every couple on this platform, upon every couple who will view these presentations afterwards. We thank you. For Pastor Allen and Sister Allen. The devil does not like them, but we pray that you will cover their family right now. We thank you for Dr. and Mrs. Nathan and their family. Cover them. We, we thank you for, for Pastor Blythe and Sister Blythe and their family. Cover them. We thank you for our president, Pastor Brown and his family and all the families that are setting positive examples around the world. We lift them up to you at this time. While Satanists are praying for the destruction of families, we are praying for the restoration and healing for our families. Cover every couple tonight, we pray. Thank you for hearing our prayers. May there be a revival and reformation in our homes as a result of us being here. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And amen. Amen. Thank you, everyone. And thanks to you, Krista, for sending the, uh, the evaluation form in Google form so that uh, you can access it. Please email it to, uh, um, or, or maybe in Google form, you will be able to get the information to us in the Family Life Department. If not, then just email the form to the address I placed there, family at uh, jmunion.org. Uh, All right. Um, uh, let me just check the chat before I close off, if there's anything that I need to know. So just give us your honest evaluation so that we can know how to improve. Um, on the offerings, we are doing our best to serve the every member of the family. We we and I hear the singles getting jealous, but we have been having singles convention, and we have been and we will be having more programs for the singles. But this time, it is for the couples, which we cannot neglect. So we are happy for the opportunity to serve the couples at this time. We, we are relating in the family ministries department to the couples, to the singles, to the men. They are relating to the, 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 uh, the, the seniors and the parents. So each year we can only have one or two activities and this year is for the couple. Next year, it will be another group, either the parents or the singles. So bear with us as we seek to meet the needs. And those of you at the local church, we are asking you to implement the strategies also to meet the various needs. Um, so thank you so much. And uh, let me just extend the profound appreciation now to all those who uh, supported so that this program could be what it, it, it was. 
We want to extend appreciation to our president, Pastor Everett Brown, um, for his wisdom and support for this program and the administration at Jamaica Union. We want to extend appreciation to the staff and the directorate for your support. Uh, we appreciation to our devotional speakers, uh, Dr. Eric Nathan and Pastor Blythe and their uh, sister Blythe who prayed and, and their families. We thank uh, our host, my wife, Sister Keisha Dennis, and this is what she loves. And I want to express how appreciative I, I am for her. She's, she has not been feeling well, and but she would not give up her post for today. She wanted to see everything through. So uh, um, I'm just grateful for you. Uh, and and, and uh, I sent the message to her, me escantadora, uh, esposa, uh, my, my much appreciation to you. Um, thank you so much. Um, the Belize Union uh, 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 Director, um, Sister Pat, um, for your support and the team, the Belize Union. Uh, Mrs. Nathan, my secretary, uh, the communication director, Ella Nigel Cook, and the technical director, Brother Christoph Williams, uh, and Sister Chantel for the production, and all the couples from around the world uh, who joined us for this program. Thank you so much, and God bless you. And much appreciation for your kind comments about the presentations. Um, this one was streamed, so you can always go back and access them. I am not sure what to say about the ones for last week because it was recorded. So we will see. I think we have your email addresses in the registration. If we do, we will see how we can get last week's presentations to you. Thank you very much. God bless you. And do have a wonderful evening. Oh, sorry. Yes, I see that. So now we're going to ask the couple. So we can't go without this one. I asked the couples to turn on their cameras, but I don't see the cameras on because that's one of the reasons I asked them because I want some of the couples now with your wine and your cake to bring them now together. Um, so, and, 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 and I'm going to pick on Odyssey and Clive. Their camera has been on from last week. So Odyssey and Clive, we're going to ask you just to... Um, uh, Brother Christoph, just open if their microphone can be open. Just open your microphone and tell us where you're, you're, you're joining us from and how long you're married. And we're going to ask you to demonstrate to us how you did it with the wine and the cake when you got married. And then we're going to take what, maybe one more we see, maybe it's, um, Black Leng. And um, don't hide, we see you. We see you there, you can't go again. <laughs> so you're going to help us now. So so yes, um, so the lengths, we're going to ask you to, to take out the cake and the wine. So show us how you did it with the wine. Uh, uh, brother, um, so tell us where you're from and how long you're married. Well, 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 well yes, you have two instruments on. All right, go ahead now. Right, so this is Odessa and Clive. Yes. And we're in Montego Bay. Okay. And this is our fourth year. Okay, congratulations. I'm going to ask you to show us now what you did four years ago when you got married with the wine, how you fed it. Okay. Is disappearing in the thing though, so I don't yes, know how we can. <laughs> we just have to drink. Yes, that's how you did. No, no, show us what you no. did. We will... It's disappearing in the background. Yes. All right, I see the glass coming around your head. <laughs> At the same time. Yes. All right, so just put those applause for them in the in the chat there. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. All right. So uh, thank you. Thank you. And God bless your marriage. Continue to, to, to participate in these events. I tell couples that the couple's education is, a, is like a counseling session 
for you again. So if you don't go and see your counselor, these things can help you to rebuild your marriage. Thank you for joining us. And you were very attentive in the session. All right, if we're giving out gifts, we would, you would have gotten top prize. Um, all right, so we're gonna ask you the lengths to show us how you did it with the cake. You have anything there that you have? You don't have um, muffins there, something? Didn't bring your cake today? Or if you have wine, then let's see what you do with the wine then. Yes. You just drink off the wine? You didn't share it with him? How did you... Oh, all right. It wasn't finished yet. All right. <laughs> all right. Thank you. All right. Thank you. And um, yes, I see St. Elizabeth. Who is this from St. Elizabeth? Thank you so much to the Lengs for that demonstration. I saw someone there from St. Elizabeth. Put in the applause for them in the chat. Brother and Sister Williams from Junction, St. Elizabeth, 15 years. All right, you have the cameras, you can put on your cameras. Last one we're gonna take, um, if you are able to, Brother and Sister Williams from St. Elizabeth. We're, I'm not seeing their camera. So let's see. They put something in the chat there, 15 years. All right, we're not seeing them. So, that's where we're going to leave it for this evening. And you can, you can continue to enjoy the evening, put on your music and have a little dance. Sorry, we are unable to go for much longer because of time, but we are leaving you now to just continue to celebrate for the rest of the evening. Thank you again, and God bless you all. We are, what the intention is that we are going to make this an annual thing. Um, as long as the calendar of events for the union can accommodate it, we will be coming back next year. We are going to do different topics and I will ask different presenters to join me and my wife for the next three years while we are at Jamaica Union. Uh, because next year we could take two other topics, four other topics and I will do two different topics and so on. So we're gonna to continue to educate in different areas of family living and see if we can cover the whole 12 um, major areas of family life over the next three or so years. Thank you again, and God bless you. Over to you, Brother Christopher. God bless. If home is where Love will be